I ask a lot of questions while I'm presenting or while I'm lecturing. So I'm going to often ask a question and I do want a response. So my first question is, I know a lot of y'all are novices or have never seen debate before, um, but what do y'all think theory is? What is theory? So it occurs when a team believes that the other team has created an unfair position, like situation. Um, it's about the rules and how we should conduct ourselves during a round. It can be about specifically something that happened in the round, something that happened before the round, something that they have seen the other team do, although that's really tricky, depending on your judge. Um, and they believe that this unfair situation should warrant a loss. Um, it's not just about the argument itself, but about how the team has decided to um, conduct themselves and how they have decided to make the debate unfair or uneducational. So it could, like I was saying, the judge decides if that unfairness or the lack of education that they have created in the round actually warrants a loss. And then generally, this is more common in your higher levels of debate, but there are a few key theory shells that you should know in your novice levels because you'll see them very often. Um, hopefully by then you'll understand this meme about theory. Um, until then, <laughs> you can always reference back. So what are parts of a theory shell? So like topicality, if that lecture has already happened. I'm not actually sure. It, you need an interpretation right at the top. What have they done wrong? What is the stance you're taking that debate should be? And this is how debate should look like. Um, then you have two, your violation. What did the team do wrong? And how that team didn't follow your interpretation. Three is standards. And that's why your stance is best for debate. And then fourth, you have your voter. So that's how the judge should evaluate the round or not the round specifically but the unfairness or uneducational um, action that the other team has committed so generally this is a reject the team um, just flat out just get rid of the team they should lose this round a lot of the times someone might argue back um, no reject the argument don't reject the team and that's like the debate you get into of like why why like the other team's action or your action was either good or bad for the round. So standards here, I left it pretty open-ended. What are some standards y'all think are used in theory? If y'all could raise your hand, I think I get a notification if y'all raise your hand or like use a reaction so I can see you. For sure, Kessler. Wait, what was the question again? Yeah, so what are some standards of a theory shell? I don't remember. Okay, does anyone else have any ideas? This is super open-ended. Think about how debate rounds are super short or they can be super long. So someone might be taking up too much time or they have made it so that you are unable to do the debate in a way that you wanted to do it. Any ideas? I see Adam. It was like a, and then a. Well, one thing that they might do is like, if they present like a plan or an argument that forces you to like, say something racist or something, which is usually not gonna win you round so you just say that it's unfair that they're taking a stance that forces you to take a racist stance okay great anything else i know it's 10 in the morning i also would be asleep right now do not worry um okay so a lot of common standard theory standard theory standards our time skew, which is what I was hinting at, is that you have taken up way too much time and it causes us as the team to have to run around and try and scramble to respond to all of your arguments. 
Um, Adam also mentioned a good one. It's that like whatever stance that they're giving or whatever um, argument they've made forces you into a corner and there's, it's undebatable. It's like if a team came up and said um, something super like just true and then it's undebatable. Um, of course there are ways around that, but it's always good to run a theory shell. Um, when you get into higher levels of debate of like Lincoln Douglas and policy, you'll see a lot more of like intricate theory shells. Um, and usually they're small little blips, but sometimes they can totally win you around because of how important that voter is. Okay, let me see. Okay, now that you know what theory is, how do y'all propose you answer theory? Let's say a debate, uh, your opponent says, that because you ran five arguments instead of three, you ruined the debate. So their interpretation is that no, you are only allowed to run five arguments. Your violation, sorry, three arguments. Your violation is that you've run five arguments. And that's better for debate because we can have in depth rounds and no one is too rushed. And the voter is for education and fairness. And as a result, you should reject the team. What are some ways that you can answer? Just, there's no right answer here. Yes, Adam. Well, I would say that it's uneducational to limit the number of uh, arguments you have because what if like a stance has many good arguments rather than just three? And then after I prove them wrong, I would say that they should be dropped from the debate because it takes longer to defend yourself against a theory shell than it does to actually write one. So they caused a greater time skew than you did. Okay, awesome. That's great. That's called a turn. If you all have went to any like basic rounds, I think, sorry, basic lectures, someone might have explained what a turn is. Basically, when you turn, it's kind of like, no, you do the thing worse. Kessler, I saw a reaction or a hand. What I wanted to say was, <clears throat> it's really hard to defend your answers. So you're going to have to it's general to always take a longer time to defend your answer. So even if I did violate the rules, I'm just defending my answer. I'm defending my answer in a way that, that can take a long time. So it's reasonable. Okay, great. So that's a reasonability argument is that I'm reasonably following your interpretation. You have to understand that this is how the round actually is going to go. Judge, do not vote on theory. Any other ideas? I see so many people who are so quiet. I see Ellen smiling. Jason, I see half of your head. Rudy, you look very attentive. Why am I only hearing from Adam, Kessler, and Rachel? Okay, I'm done. I'll continue. Um, answering theory. So the first thing that you have on theory is generally a we me. Sometimes it doesn't always apply, but it can be important to say, yes, we're actually following exactly what you said. Um, again, it definitely depends on the interpretation. Um, yes. Uh, all of these slides have a meme on it, just seeing Kessler's um, little note here in the chat. And once y'all start understanding theory, these will be a lot more funny. I tried to choose ones that were um, understandable. Okay. And then two, you have your counter interpretation. Generally, you have a different interpretation for how the debate should go. And that's where your counter interpretation comes. It's your idea of whether theory, uh, their theory shell is either good or bad. Sometimes it's the complete opposite of what the other team said, and you will still say a we meet. Um, and other times it's just a dilation, yes, a dilation of what the other team has said. And you have your counter standards. So standards as to why your interpretation is actually better, why your action is actually good for the debate. You also have your own voter. Generally, it'll, like I was saying, include reject the argument, not the team, because you can always lose an argument, but you cannot lose the round. So you can always pick another argument to win. You can always choose some, a different angle, but if you just lose the round flat out, from theory, you won't be able to make any other arguments. Five is reasonability, like Kessler was saying, super on the point. Um, so reasonability is generally like, hey, let's say 
using the same um, example from before, someone says you can only run three arguments in a round, but you actually ran four. And the fourth argument is kind of small and related to one of them. And then you can say reasonability. Like we reasonably run about three. It's not that far. It's not a stretch. It's not like we ran 10 arguments here, judge. We only ran four. And one of them is related to an argument that we already made. So it would be unstrategic for us to only run half of that argument. And then six is line by line. This is a kind of a piece of jargon people use, um, but it basically, basically means you just respond to everything that they said. So let's say using that same example that the team says it's better for time skew because it forces the negative, sorry, not time skew, for research, because it actually forces the negative to do in-depth research on whatever they have decided to debate. And that means it's better for fairness because the affirmative also has to do a lot of research into their affirmative and affirmatives won't lose on small blippy debates. Like let's say a debater decided to run a plan that was like the USFG, the United States federal government should substantially limit the amount of um, F1, no, Yes, F-1 visas that are given out to limit uh, immigration. And the other team just came up and ran 10 blippy arguments. That means super small, super random, unwarranted. There's no reason why these arguments are true. And you're saying that by doing better research, you have better rounds. And so you would have to respond to those things. You cannot just run one through five and then be able to beat theory. You need to go back and respond specifically to what they said in their theory shell. Okay, those are the basics. Anyone have any questions? I went super fast. No questions are stupid. I assure you have asked a stupider question if you think your question is stupid. It took me too long to figure out what theory was. It can be a clarification question. It could be something totally unrelated, like, Lily, what do you do with your hair to make it so straight? And I would respond, because it's straight because I'm Asian and it'll never curl. <laughs> uh... Don't think about the specifics, Kessler. <laughs> okay. At least we don't see any confused faces. Okay, I'm gonna move on then. Um, oh, Ellen, I do see your question. Um, okay, so depending on, so her question is, when you say a theory, how do you phrase it? So I'm a policy debater, my just general knowledge comes from policy debate. And in a policy round, we would say, next is theory. Um, let's say it's disclosure theory. Does everyone know what disclosure means? Okay, so it's basically what the word means. A lot of the times before a round, debaters will tell the other team what they have run in the past. So what arguments they have made in the past and gone for, it doesn't matter if they won on it or not. Um, but that basically tells them, hey, we want this round to be fair. We want us to both be prepared. So here's what we're mutually going to agree that we're going to tell you what our plan is and the negative is going to tell the affirmative what they have run in the past. So any disadvantages, what counter plans they've run. That way they can kind of start to strategize before the round starts. I don't know if I said that word right. So let's say the team didn't do that. And so right before you can say theory, disclosure theory, the affirmative must disclose their plan before the round, which gives the negative at least 20 minutes to prepare. And Adam's making a face, but that's because Adam doesn't do a real debate event. Um, <laughs> sorry, Adam. Um, <laughs> And so as a result, that's how you would run your theory shell. You would say interpretation, teams must disclose their plan or previous arguments 20 minutes before the round. That's best for time, um, fairness, and just general um, truth testing. That just means we can test each other more in depth. And 
as a result, that's how you list it off. And then the other team would go, when they're going down their list of arguments, they would go, now on to disclosure theory. And then they would say, first, we meet. We did disclose our affirmative when in the 1AC. That's absolute BS. That's them saying we disclosed when the round started, when we stood up and started reading our affirmative. That's when we disclosed. That does not meet. I'm just going to put that out there. And then you would say counterinterpretation. Disclosure can happen whenever it's a mutual agreement. We did not agree to disclose. And that's how you just go down. Um, I don't know how it works in other debate events. Maybe Adam can attest to this. Um, but generally, that's how you go. It's you name it off the bat, and then you go down and list the arguments that you have made and then are trying to respond um, in a theory shell. Does that answer your question, Ellen? Okay, cool. Theory is one of those things where if I don't give you some jargon, um, it's kind of hard to conceptualize because it is such like a rules thing. Um, so you kind of need some sort of background. Adam is making a face. Care to share with the crowd, Adam? I'm just saying that in parley, you get 20 minutes to do all of your research, create plans, counter plans, and all that and you don't get to know anything the other side is doing. So, I don't know, disclosure theory is a lot of BS to me. And you get literally a whole year to come up with plans. You don't need to know what they're doing before, and you should be ready. Mm, okay, you tell me that when their plan has a specific differentiation between 11 planes versus 12 planes. You both don't get Parley, it does not leave California, y'all. You need to go to a educational debate. Um, okay, okay. Okay. Um, I will say though, I did partly. It was very fun. It was very stressful. I felt like an idiot with a chicken, like a chicken with its head cut off. But um, it's fine. It's because I just didn't prepare. I'm. There was a scandal that happened as well. I had to. I was forced to drop around, but I'm not going to get into that, um, mainly because this is recorded and I have not contested to anything. Yes, Kessler. I feel like Adam does have a point. You should be prepared if you have one year to do it, one year of preparation. You should be prepared to see what the other side needs to hear. And also, there's a fifth part to the meme. The groom meme has a fifth part. Okay, I did not, um, I did not, I did not make this meme. Um, yes, great point, Hani. Not every plan is the same. Okay, common theory arguments. First is conditionality. It kind of has to relate with how many arguments you decide to run. So a conditional argument is a stance that the negative can make without having to go for it, which means that they don't need to continue arguing for it throughout the round. That means the argument is conditional. So in a debate round, the affirmative has to continuously defend their affirmative, no matter what. There are no changes that can be made um, from arguments that you've already made. You can drop things, which means you can stop arguing, but ultimately what you are defending has to be the same. Whereas the negative can um, propose these things cal called counterplans, or they can take a stance without actually having to continue making that stance. Um, does everyone know what a counterplan is? Okay, a counterplan is a kind of the same thing as a plan on the affirmative, um, but it can use any actor um, to decide how to solve the affirmative in a better way. So let's say it was the education topic, um, which basically means that the USFG should substantially change education, whether that's through funding or through new policy. So education isn't under the USFG, it's mainly under states. So a counter plan could be do the plan except have the states implement it because that's more effective, each state has its own rules. That's a very standard counterplan. It just change the actor. It can also be something that can solve the impacts of the affirmative better. So let's say the affirmative says they solve for racism. 
by adding more um, structural policy. So that's like changing how like the police work. Whereas the negative might say counter plan, let's increase funding for low income students. That way they can um, have a higher education, which has statistically always solved racism, or at least given these people a better chance. And that's kind of the debate you have. Conditionalities, does that answer your question, Hani? Okay, great. So conditionality says that the negative cannot have conditional arguments or has a limit on how many conditional things that they can run. So this usually happens when the negative decides to run like five counter plans and the affirmative has to answer each of those counter plans, which can take a lot of time because it's five separate um, developed or not developed counter plans. And at the very end, the negative can choose to not choose to continue arguing for however many one of those counter plans. A lot of the times during cross X, you'll ask, is this plan conditional? Is your counter plan conditional? Which means, are you going to go for this in your last speech? Are you going to continue arguing for it? Or are you just going to drop this and I'm still going to have to answer it and waste my time doing it? So a lot of the times when negatives run a lot of counter plans, they run a lot of different stances the affirmative will run a conditionality theory, which is just saying you cannot have this many conditional arguments, it's unfair, it ruins time, it has time skew, it's um, uneducational because we don't actually get to talk about the plan. Okay, we already talked about disclosure, basically just when the team doesn't disclose before the round. Fiat, does anyone know what fiat means? Adam, I see a hand. Well, it's like, is this possible or not? It's kind of. Doesn't it say on the slide? It just says yeah. assume action is possible. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, I can't really talk for any other um, events, but fiat, I've done other events. I just didn't care to learn the jargon. But fiat, in at least policy rounds, talks about how you cannot just it just assume things into action. Basically, if I were to propose a plan that the USFG should increase funding to um, the police sector, whatever, um, no comment. Uh, probably not a good idea, but that's besides the point. Uh, Fiat would say we assume that's into action, we assume it works, and as a result, we assume that the impacts it could solve for or the impacts it could cause would also happen, um, given probability and whatnot. Um, fiat can work on many different levels. The affirmative is usually granted fiat, depending on your round. Um, it basically says your plan can happen. The debate is whether or not it should happen. But the argument with fiat comes in is when negatives decide to use like international fiat, basically assuming that another country will do something or fiat on the state level, fiat on a specific person, depending on how specific they get with what they're saying in their counter plans. And as a result, the affirmative will tend to argue no, the negative does not get fiat. We do not get to assume that anything the negative says will be in action. It's a debate of whether or not the affirmative can happen, should happen, but it's not whether or not anything that the negative said is also going to happen. Um, they, so when the debate comes to a can versus should, so it's whether or not the counter plan can happen and should happen, not just whether it should happen. Does that make sense? Fiat is one of those things that took me like a year to figure out. Someone said it in a debate round. I was like, what does that mean? And I looked it up and it's like, this is Latin. And I was like, great, I'm talking a lot. Any questions? What does ARD mean? Huh? Oh, ARD um, or... is what I use for arguments, um, if you go to my flowing lecture, you'll learn that you need shorthand. 
And a lot of the times I'll shorthand arguments to args. Okay, Hani, um, can you give an example of how someone would use fiat? Yeah, great. So my friend ran a fiat, uh, a counter plan. So it was on an international topic um, talking about arms sales. And they argued that the UN, a specific country, should just vote no, which is better than the United States federal government doing something. Um, the speci specifics aren't important. Um, but that's international fiat. That's assuming that another country will do something. That yes, this country has motive, this country has is willing to, has the ability to do something. So that's international fiat. That's saying forcing another country to do something. Um, back to that state's counter plan, Fiat would assume that the states can do this. So let's say California has a lot of funding for, um, for education. They have a lot of money that they can pour into the education system. But let's say like Alabama has less funding. But by saying states should do, assumes that all the states can do this. It's assuming that yes, the states will, can, and sh should do it. And that's what fiat is. It's that you are able to jump the hurdle of deciding whether or not they can do it and then immediately have the debate of whether it should happen. Um, fiat on the affirmative can also be used as in every round that has a policy argument. It's just fiat. A lot of times people will say circumvention, Trump votes no, he'll veto the plan. But that ruins the debate because then we can't actually talk about the affirmative just because Trump decides to veto it. Um, and that's why it's less of a can debate and more of a should debate. So usually affirmatives are granted fiat, is that it will, can happen, it will happen. And as a result, we should be debating whether or not the affirmative should happen. Does that make sense? Awesome, great. And if it doesn't, totally call me out. I talk way too fast. Um, my brother can attest to it. He is sitting here with half his forehead on the camera. Um, onto counter plans. So there's a lot of counter plan theories. It's because people start to run the weirdest stuff. If you went to the intro to policy debate, you will know that people start to create crazy arguments because the topic is year round and people get bored and they want to win rounds in better ways. So there are lots. Yes, Kessler. My Brother is Jason. We are a policy debate legacy. My sister also did policy debate. Okay, so the plan inclusive counter plan is just saying that the counter plan can include the plan. Um, so it'd be like if I, um, if you and your friends were making plans and you said, let's go to the Davis Creamery downtown. And then you would propose a plan that's like, we should go to the Davis Creamery downtown and also get fries at Pluto's. And so that can also happen in a debate round. It's saying the plan is a good idea, but we should also do this other thing. So that's plan inclusive counter plan. Um, a lot of people say that's a bad thing because it totally ruins affirmative ground. The affirmative has proposed a great plan. The negative clearly thinks so because they decide to include the plan in the counter plan. But as a result, they can argue for everything that the plan does as well as some other thing, which obviously makes the, um, the counter plan better because you two by including the plan have reached here but then let's say the negative decides well, let's use my previous example we should also get fries so ice cream great ice cream and fries super great right it makes it to be unfair topical counter plan is just saying it's a plan that can happen on the affirmative so does everyone know what topicality is I'm getting a yes, I think, maybe, hopefully. I have no idea what Kessler just said. Okay, topicality is basically saying that the plan, oh, okay, so I'm gonna explain it briefly. Topicality is basically saying that the affirmative um, is topical. It can have, it's something that fits the resolution. It fits every definition of the words in the resolution, it's usually debated in the round itself. But a topical counter plan is basically 
a plan that could be run on the affirmative on the affirmative side so let's say the resolution again what's education we should increase substantially increase increase regulation and funding for education and the affirmative proposes in order to um, solve i guess inequality we should provide school lunches to everyone that way everyone is able to access free meals they're able to be well nutritious and have a good day at school. Let's say the, uh, the negative says, to solve inequality, we should increase funding for school infrastructure. The United States federal government should. So under the resolution, their counter plan can also be a plan on the affirmative. And some people argue that topical counter plans are A, either the only type of counter plan that can be run or be not allowed at all because of how it forces the affirmative to work in different ways. It allows the negative to access affirmative ground. That means the negative can access affirmative arguments um, and that makes the debate unfair. Okay, plan plus counter plan is a little bit like plan inclusive counter plan. Basically just we do the affirmative plus something else. Um, same thing. Fries and ice cream, better than just ice cream. Um, consult counter plan is kind of a weird argument to be making, but essentially the affirmative might say consulting, let's say the plan was, I'm going to use my ice cream fries again. So let's say you and your friends are going to go downtown and you are all like, we should go get ice cream. But then one of your friends is saying, we should ask our parents and then decide if we can go get ice cream. So that's kind of like a consult counter plan. You go and ask someone else for advice before doing the plan. So um, this can happen a lot in like, uh, sorry, plans that include Native Americans that are like, we need to ask Native Americans before we actually enact the plan. And that ruins affirmative ground for X, Y, Z. Um, usually they're saying it means that like, it adds a condition to just like another thing before the affirmative can do what it's doing, which ruins affirmative ground because the negative has essentially stolen the affirmative plan by just adding a small consult above it. Okay, delay CP. Delay CP is what it sounds like. It's a counter plan that delays the plan. So let's say the election this year is in 2020, right? But we know that the plan will probably get circumvented by Trump. Like, like, let's say it was like a policing. This year for policy, it's about policing. So Jalay CP would say, let's wait until after the election. And then after the election, we propose the plan. And then that's the delay. See how there's no difference in the affirmative except for when it happens. That's why affirmative thinks it's abusive. And the final common theory argument I have here Counterplans, there are a lot of theory arguments because people think counterplans are like abusive, but then they're on the negative and then they run five counterplans. Um, so performative contradiction is what it sounds like. It's like if I argued that the economy um, shutting down will cause nuclear war, but then I argued that the economy is um, stable. So that's like contradictory, right? One argument I say, the economy is everything. It's gonna cause nuclear war, it's gonna cause um, backlash. And then the arg other argument I say, the economy is stable, we are safe, right? So that's contradictory. Usually people will point it out. Performative contradiction usually happens in higher level debates where um, let's say an affirmative runs, sorry, not affirmative. Let's say like the negative argues that like racism is bad in a critique. You don't need to know what a critique is. It's just like um, like looking at the debate from a different perspective. Um, and then they say something super racist. That's like a performative contradiction. I think. OK, we have like a quick little activity because I'm supposed to give you all an activity. And I did not know what else to do because theory is very technical. So I'm going to open it to the floor to ask questions um, for reference. I know I didn't introduce myself, but if y'all have any questions at all, uh, like after this, um, you can always email me. I'm gonna throw my email in the chat. It's also in the Google Classroom from the intro to policy debate. Um, 
Oh, I send that to Annie specifically. Whoops. How do I send it to everyone? everyone. Yeah. Sorry, I found yeah, it. I found that um, the blue button, it, there's a choice. Yeah, blue I found it. Thank you, Kessler. Yeah. Okay, it should be sent now. Um, you don't even have to ask questions about theory if you want. Um, any questions at all? I have a question. Um, for disclosure, do you always have to do it before a round? Okay, so no. There is no rule that tells you that you have to disclose. None. It's more of like, once you get to that level where you're just like terrified, not actually terrified, but like the chances, if you go against like a good team and you know that they run like a bunch of arguments, I see a cat. Was that a cat, Emmy? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, essentially, a theory disclosure is something that, again, you have to mutually agree on. If one team says they want to disclose, but the other team is like, no, I don't want to disclose, then you don't disclose. Um, or if you're cocky and you think that the other team is just definitely going to lose no matter what, and they don't disclose, but you decided to disclose, that's totally up to you. So disclosure is never written in anywhere. Some judges will buy it, like, hey, yeah, you should definitely disclose. We're this deep into, like, the debate, like, the debate year, um, the debate season. It's at that point where you should be settled and ready to, like, let other teams know. Um, disclosure can also happen um, through, at least in policy, through the policy debate wiki. Um, that's where policy debaters will put every argument they've ever gone for. You'll see teams that have like 20 affirmatives and like 40 different arguments that they've met, made on the negative. And then you of course want to ask like, do I need to prepare for all 40 of these or all 20 of these? Um, you probably will not hit in, like run into that until you start going to a bunch of invitationals. So do not freak out. Um, but <laughs> essentially it's something that like, the community has agreed upon that we should be disclosing so that we can have better debate rounds so that when you run get into the round everyone kind of knows what they're already going to go for uh, or they're already going to argue for okay thank you mm -hmm. is debate theory mostly for um policy debate um i don't think so i remember parley always talking about theory and yeah i can answer that question yeah, Lincoln Douglas also definitely does theory. Um, uh, Alex, if you yeah. want to chime in. So, like, Lincoln Douglas and policy are able to, like, actually talk about theory for a long time because, like, they can focus the debate. And also, like, policy is, like, an hour and a half, but parley is only an hour. Um, but also because, like, you only have 20 minutes to prepare, it's, like, really unfair if you decide, I'm just going to run theory. Um, because then, like, <laughs> You only have 20 minutes to prepare, so you're going to end up just, like, copying a ton of stuff down. And then that, that like, completely messes the debate. It's sort of a higher-level thing. Um, yeah, and if you're going to run theory in Parley at all, if ever, it's going to be, like, very basic and kind of... It's, like, very... It's, like, put together, but it's not, like, super expensive because you yeah, don't need to I spend would so much say... Time. Sorry... I would say yeah, it stays pretty underdeveloped throughout the round unless the other team has made like a huge mistake. Yeah. Um, yeah. Adam, I saw like a... Yeah. Oh yeah, I was just going to add in. Like the only thing Hans and I ran into and like at SU, we like ran some like pretty abusive counter plans. The only thing we ever came into is like one plan plus and like a couple topicalities, but that was it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and that was like nine rounds, so... Yeah, LD and policy utilize theory at a more developed level usually. Um, whereas like Parley, I don't think PubFo even has theory. I, do we have any PubFo debaters? We have PubFo debaters and I have seen other teams uh, use theory, but that's like, it's like the top like national circuit level team. Yeah, generally you will not have to worry about theory as long as you're not doing soup, something super abusive. Um, we go to like two types of art, uh, two types of like debate, speech and debate tournaments. One's on the league level. You probably will never see theory there. Um, and then we go to invitationals and you'll see a little bit more theory. But honestly, unless you've like hit like a national circuit debater, you most likely will never see theory at all. 
Any other questions? Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? I like how all of y'all have like your rooms painted, a lot of blue. Emmy has yellow happening. It's very pretty. Okay, um, so I have like a very short um, little activity kind of like to practice and see how y'all are feeling. So basically you're just going to match this um, shell to the violation. Um, feel free to just like hit unmute and chime in. I'm gonna give you like two minutes to do it by yourself. I think number one, the opposition they didn't tell you the plan oh. before. What? Um, oh, Kessler, I'm giving everyone a little bit of time to do it by themselves, and then we'll go over it as a group. Okay, about a minute left. I have to end soon, right, Alex? Yeah, you can go slowly over if you need to. Okay. My coffee's kicking in, y'all. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. So Kessler, you were about to jump on that first one. So do you want to answer number one? So I was thinking that, number one, the opposition didn't tell you the plan before round. Wasn't it the disclosure? Yes, great. Um, I'm going to pick people. Olivia, what is the answer to number two? Um, for number two, it would be um, the delay. Awesome. Great. Um, let's pick another person here. Hani, you had lots of questions that were super insightful. Tell me about number three. Uh, number three is... Uh, international fiat bad. Great. Okay. Um, who else am I picking? Rudy, tell me about number four. Well, number four is condo bad. Great. Okay. And number five. I talked about this one. Valdi, do you have an answer for me? Number one five is performative. Yeah, awesome. Performative contra. Uh, sorry, my bad. Contradiction. Performative contradiction. Usually, I abbreviate this as perfcon because it's way too hard to say and takes way too much time. Um, perfcon bad. Great. Thank you, y'all, for all interacting. Um, I think we have two minutes. Does anyone have any questions? What did y'all have for breakfast, if y'all don't have any questions? I'm bored. Not bored, but like just tired. <laughs> any questions? Okay, again, if y'all... Mm -hmm. Can we do like a little um, something of a debate for the time we have? Something of a debate? Okay. Um, 